Today we're going to do a code review, sort of. What I really want to do today is highlight a project from one of my students that I think might be helpful to the rest of you. Welcome back everybody. It is great to imagine seeing your smiling faces. I hope life is treating you well. This video was inspired by a conversation I had with Thomas, who is a good friend, a former student, and one of the great people who helped support this channel on Patreon. Thomas and I were recently having a conversation during my virtual office hours, and there were just a lot of things in that conversation that I thought might be helpful to you, and so I thought, let's make a video about it. I asked Thomas's permission, and he said I could. So normally at this point, I say that all code from this video is gonna be on Patreon. You, typically, that's the case, and that's that's normally how I do things. In this case, however, the code is Thomas's. It's all available publicly on GitHub, and so I'll just link down in the description and you can just check it out. But now let me give you some backstory. So last summer I taught an online class. It was the first online class I've actually ever taught, and it was an adventure, it was a lot of fun. And Thomas took that first class, and in that class we talked about a lot of different strategies for learning to become a better programmer. We went over common mistakes that student programmers make, we talked about modular programming, we talked about software testing, setting up projects, design patterns, and a bunch of other stuff. And when all was said and done, I sent my students off into the world, hopefully to do great things and to continue honing their skills skills. Because obviously in a three-week course, it's not like we can solve all the world's problems. We can't give you everything you need to succeed in this field. And so the other day when we were talking, Thomas and I got to catch up and he was showing me some of the stuff he's been working on. I thought it was really cool. I wanted to share it with you. So that's what I'm going to do right now. And at this point, some of you may be saying, hey, wait, you teach a class. Can I take that class? And the answer is nope. Sorry, that was a once in a lifetime chance. That class will never be taught again. But I am in the process of repackaging, retooling some of that stuff into a different class. And that new course I am pre-releasing on Thinkific today. I say pre-releasing because it's still under construction. I'm still working out some kinks. I'm adding in. I've still got some content that I'm trying to get in there. So it's not quite finished, but I wanted to make it available to all of you in case you want to jump in and get started even though the course isn't completely finished. And just in case some of you are nervous about the unfinished part of it, I did decide to offer this course at half off while I finish it up. So the current price won't last forever. Eventually it will go back up to the normal price. But for now, any of you who wanna jump in, start the course and sort of look at the stuff that I'm working on, it's available half off. So you don't have to wait. I'll put a link down in the description. Feel free to check it out if you think it might be helpful. But enough of that. Now let's take a look at Tomo's code. Okay, now I'm not going to walk through every line on this one. It's up on GitHub. You can all check it out at your leisure. Of course, it's also an active project. So things may change a little between now when I'm showing it to you. And I mean, hopefully it's getting better all the time. And I know he's working on it actively. But there were some things about this I wanted to point out that I think might help you. So the first is that this project is a great example of scratching your own itch. So you've heard me say in previous videos, we talked about projects and coming up with project ideas. But in case you haven't heard it, as you're looking for projects to work on, you're trying to teach yourself how to program, you're looking for something to do that's going to hone your skills and build your confidence and whatever, it's always a good idea to do something that you care about or something that you're going to use, something that matters to you. And in this project, Thomas did just that. So basically, he noted that he was spending a lot of time translating between German and English, and he didn't want to keep jumping between his terminal and his web browser. So he decided to make a terminal front end for the dictionary web page that he uses, which is dictcc. So we can see the web page that he was actually using here. They're not sponsoring this channel or anything. I'm not promoting this web page. It's just the one that he used. But the point is that this makes a great learning project because he's going to actually use it. This is, he's making a tool for himself. He's going to test it day by day. He's going to be motivated to fix issues and add features. It's not just going to be something that he implements today and then forgets about tomorrow or worse and more common, something that he starts on today and never finishes. So the second thing I really like about this project is that he used it to bring together a bunch of different things that he learned both in the course and things that I've covered on the channel and even a few that I haven't. So this is things like project setup, unit testing, modular design, uh, curl, you can see this here, uh, curses, which he's seen on the channel, and also regular expressions, which you'll see when we actually look into the code. So basically this is all stuff that he was trying to make sure he understood. And so he brought them all together and integrated them into a single project. And also he integrated it in a way that took him beyond what I had taught him. So it was more than just the things he had seen in the video. He extended, he didn't just repeat what he had seen, but he extended what he had learned, exploring new features, as well as solidifying his understanding. And the third thing I'm really liking here, and this is why I'm sitting here on this readme, is that he took this project very seriously. He's treating this like a serious professional or community project where he's documenting his process, he's keeping track of the work to date, 
the to-do list, the stuff that needs to happen in the future. And of course, there are a lot of different ways we can do this. He's using his readme file, which integrates well with GitHub. But my point is that with so many students I'm learning to program projects, they're really sloppy, super sloppy. And I get it. You're thinking nobody is ever going to see this. I don't have to make it nice. And sometimes that's true. And sometimes it might even be the right move if you're in a hurry. But the point is here, Tomo is using this one to learn not just how to create C code, but he's also learning how to create and document and manage a project. And he's trying to build habits, really good habits that are going to serve him well in the future. And so I really want to applaud that before we jump in because that aspect of this project really makes me happy. And of course, taking all these things seriously is also going to make it easier for him to share this project with other people to turn it into something bigger if he wants to at some point. But now at this point, enough of looking at the readme, let's take a look at the code. Of course, now I'm gonna gloss over a lot uh, because there's a lot of code here and this is gonna be a short video, but if you see something in here that you'd like to understand more about, let me know down in the comments. I'm happy to try to revisit some of this stuff in a future video. So first let's take a look. He's got a make file right here. Let's take a look at the make file. The make file looks solid, pretty straightforward. He's using variables, he's using pattern substitution. Uh, some of that stuff is stuff that we talked about in the course, and I've also touched on it on this channel. I like how he's keeping his tests separate from his source files. That's really great. Actually, I love that he's doing testing at all. That in and of itself needs to be celebrated. And you can see down here, he's automated it to make running his tests really, really easy. That's great. And now, so let's just jump back. And if we look, let's look in the source folder. And what I want to point out here first is his modular design. So, so many self-driven student projects end up as one massive .c or .cpp file that contains all the code and this is just much nicer. It's clear how what pieces he has in his project, how they fit together. The individual modules are named in a way that it's pretty clear. We can see how they actually work, what they actually do. That's great. Of course, I want to emphasize that this isn't just a C thing. No matter what language you're using, you really want to look at ways to break your code down into small, understandable, testable chunks. And now, as I mentioned before, I'm not gonna be able to look through all of these, but let's look at one or two. Let's start with, uh, maybe let's start with this first one, data center, and let's look at the .h file first. Okay, so the .h file here is going to manage the translations that he pulls down, okay? So this is basically gonna store all of the data he gets from the website. He's got some nice if def guards up here. I have a video on those if you haven't seen them before. And basically his header file, as usually is the case, basically has your interface to the rest of the program. So this is the stuff that anyone else is going to work with. One thing that I'll note here, a couple things. First of all is, so he's defined his struct right here and then used a type def to give it, give it a better name. This is fine, although you can also just merge these into one type def where you put the type def up here before the struct and the name down here. I also do want to point out a little bit that some of these members of the struct are a little like, I mean, I'm, I can guess maybe what ID is. I'm not really sure what NR or VL or VR is and then is marked. I can kind of guess that. So there may be a little bit of a naming issue here. Tomo, if you're listening, you might want to check that out. Personally, I would go in and make these a little more readable. Now let's take, now let's back up. Uh, let's go back in here and look at the .c file. So this also looks pretty good. You get some similar issues or whether they're issues, similar comments, I would say about both the type defs and the naming. Although in this case, the you know, vocab and the next this, these are making more sense. I can guess what these things mean. I can see he's got a couple of linked lists in here. That's fun. Not something that he was working on. And I also noticed that he's got, he's separating things into private variables and private methods, private functions right here. He's basically trying to keep track of the things that stay in the module and the things that are outside. Now, one comment that I will make is that these functions, it's great that he's lumped these in here and he hasn't put these, you notice, in the header file, so that's great. But we could take it a step further and we could make these static, which would basically put these functions strictly in this translation unit. And that would basically mean that no one could call these functions from outside this particular module. But yeah, so if we look down through the rest of this, things are looking pretty clean. I think here we probably, there's, there's some different ways that we could handle this logic, but this looks okay right now. Uh, also, I noticed, you know, we've talked a little about this in the past, but, you know, he's using string copy uh, and let's see if there's any more of those. So things like sprintf. And, and the issue with these, I talked a little bit about in, the pa in a past video, we talked a little bit about how strings, when you're not checking how long things are, 
you can get into trouble with, you can get hacked. In this case though, the risk is low because he is accepting input from a, from a website that he trusts as long as he does in fact trust dict.cc, but it is possible that he might get words that are longer than his strings and you could end up with some problems with crashes, things like that. In this case, I think he's probably pretty safe, but it wouldn't hurt to move some of these to like use strncopy or snprintf that actually do bounds limitations on your buffers and, and make sure that you don't get buffer overruns that could crash your program or worse, open up a vulnerability that someone could exploit. Okay, so then if we come down here, yeah. Okay, so this is all, I like that he's grouping his methods by public and private. That allows you really easily to tell what is the public facing interface and what isn't, what's staying inside the module. Now let's let's come back up here, let's, let's pop up a level again, I wanna look at a different module because something else that I wanted to point out about this code here. So we've, let's look at, I wanna look at the web client.c. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about how we use, how we can use curl for some easy networking stuff. And he's using curl here, which is great. And you also know, as I mentioned, regex. So he's basically using regular expressions for his searching. I think that's great. I'll let you look at that. I'm not going to go into that right now. But one thing I did want to point out is that one thing that I didn't talk about in my previous example with curl is how to, when we talked about how to do get requests, I didn't talk about how to do post requests or open sessions. And that's something that he does down here. So we basically have, you know, some open session and some post information. Basically, if you wanted to post a form or something like that on a web page, which he does here, because some of the interactions that he wants to do with this web page requires him to post something. So of course I may do a video in the future where we break down all the individual pieces of this. But for now, if you're interested, this is a good example of how to do it. Because again, all this code is available at least at the time of filming and of time of posting, this is available on GitHub. So check out the project. I hope it's helpful to any of you that are just getting started, that are trying to come up with ideas for what kind of projects you can work on on your own. Or just if you wanna see an example of how someone is actually trying to teach themselves how to program, and some of the projects that they came up with. And of course, if you are one of those people that are getting started, and especially if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling lost, if you're feeling like you're not sure where to start, or you're watching other people seemingly do the same stuff you're doing, but get different results, and you wanna dig into why, of course, check out the course I mentioned earlier. That's specifically what we target, is really looking at how you approach learning to program and learning computing topics. As I mentioned before, it's still under construction, half off while it is under construction, and is definitely not for every one of you out there, but for some of you, it might change your life. So if you think that might be you, check it out. For the rest of you, like this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe so you don't miss the future videos that are definitely coming, and until next week, I'll see you later.